Well, I'm happy to have you here today. We're going to go through the ABCs of cancer screening. Um, as we said in our course description, I think we're all seeing an, an increasing and changing need in this area. Our patients are all living a lot longer with highly effective modulators. As with aging comes increased risk of malignancy. Um, we have transplant patients that are now years out and have been immunosuppressed and have their own special uh, malignancy risks. Um, also, there's things that we have to keep an eye out for emerging malignancies that we may need to start screening for. And um, although we all encourage our patients to stay current with primary care, a lot of them view us as their primary care agent, whether that's appropriate or not. I had somebody the other day say, I want to ask you about something. It's not really related to CF. And I said, that won't stop you from asking, will it? And he said, no. So, so um, and also it's partially our job to educate our, our community colleagues in primary care and other specialty about a screening that may be indicated or risks that are indicated for our CF patients. Um, so disclosures, uh, my name's Lynn Fries. I'm an adult APP out of uh, Western New York, Buffalo to be specific. Katie, I'll let you introduce yourself. I am, is this on too? Yeah, we're good. Yep. Um, I'm Katie Stahl. I'm a PA with the Adult CF Group at Jefferson in Philadelphia. I also have no disclosures. So uh, learning objectives, we kind of want to look and see what the prevalence is of disease in the registry as we know it now. Uh, talk about how we are implementing the current recommendations for cancer screening with and differing recommendations specific to CF, which those have been changing over the recent years. And then, as I said, identify future areas of malignancy that may be evolving within the CF population. Um, this is our itinerary. I won't belabor it because Katie's going to introduce each of our speakers as they come up. And um, everybody's going to have about 15 minutes, each of our speakers. So we're going to hold questions till the end. Erin um, has to leave after her presentation, but I think you have put up your email in case somebody has a question for her after she's departed. And in regards to the questions, um, there's a feature on the app that you can submit them, or we can go to these microphones here. So when it comes to the question portion, those are your two options. And if you want to submit them early by the app, that's okay, too. They'll come to um, our list. And Erin, I think you're up. All right. So Erin Tallarico is a nurse by training, and she works for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation as the Senior Director of Advanced Lung Disease and Transplant. She's been with the foundation for seven years and was previously an adult CF nurse coordinator at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, where she also spent time as a transplant coordinator. She's a CF registry expert and will be speaking today about the latest data from the registry related to malignancy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Lynn and Katie for the invitation to speak. Um, CF Registry Expert is very kind. Um, uh, not quite there yet, but here's my disclosure slide. I am an employee of the CF Foundation, and I also just wanted to take a moment to thank Alex Elbert, who is our Registry Expert, who's in the audience, who really is the one who did the majority of this analysis of our patient registry, as well as helping to put the slides together. So thanks, Alex. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to start looking um, at the CF patient registry and how we currently collect history of cancer. Um, so we started in 2003 collecting um, a single field, was added to the encounter form under other complications. So people are able to click that cancer is confirmed by histology. So between 2003 and 2018, that was the only way we were really collecting um, cancer. In 2019, um, the patient registry started capturing colorectal cancer, which we'll hear about more in another talk today. But on the annual form, um, under the results of the colonoscopy, you could click colorectal cancer. And what this graph shows is the ways that we are receiving this information in the registry. In the dark blue bar are cancers that we're capturing via the encounter only form. So that would be just cancer confirmed by histology. And then in the green bar, that's the cancer via the annual form only, so colorectal cancer. And then we've seen about 11%, up to 11% of cancers were reported only through that annual form from 2019 to 2023. Um, there are another couple of ways that you can um, collect the data in the registry. Again, the encounter form complications. You are also able to free text um, the type of cancer in the encounter form complications, which is where a lot of this data actually is coming from. In 2010, we added a reason for hospitalization in the care episodes um, as other, right? So we're not actually calling out cancer as a reason for hospitalization, but we have found 
that some people are putting cancer in here um, as the reason for hospitalization. We already talked about the annual form and collecting colorectal cancer as part of the colonoscopy results. And then lastly, in 2022, as a primary cause of death, cancer was added there in the demographic form. So these are all of the different ways that we currently um, capture cancer in the registry. And as you can see, analysis requires a very thorough review of all of these different fields um, and free text entries. Um, so when we look at gathering all of the possible data, um, looking at the other complications, the colonoscopy results, we did notice by adding those additional registry fields, including reason for hospitalization and primary cause of death, um, that did increase the number of reported cancers by another five to 10%. Um, so those did add a lot of value. Um, next, we looked at the uh, annual new cases as well as the cumulative prevalence of um, cancer in individuals with CF. And as you can see over the last couple of years in the orange bar, those are our incidents and those have been increasing. Um, most recently in 2023, there were 82 reported. There are some issues with cancer data. I think it's really important to be transparent about that and to think about how we can do a better job moving forward of capturing this really important data. Um, as I've mentioned, there's limited cancer data collection. Only colorectal cancer was consistently captured um, since 2019. Other cancer types have not been systematically recorded prior to this year. Um, data entry challenges. Can cancer information has not really been prioritized in CF patient registry data collection, um, which really leads to a potential for underreporting and incomplete data. Third, we have a lack of comprehensive cancer tracking. Um, there is no way to track cancer remissions. They are not recorded in the patient registry um, and really no longitudinal data on the cancer progression or outcomes of those with cancer. And then lastly, this really all boils down to implications for research and patient care. Um, it's, it makes it very difficult to assess the true cancer prevalence in the population and ultimately leads to some challenges in studying the cancer patterns um, and the risk factors for our CF patients. Next, we'll move on to looking at how many people in the CF patient registry have a history of cancer. So this is started back in 2012 through 2023. And as you'll see, there's three and a half times more um, patients with a history of cancer in the registry today compared to back in 2012. Um, looking at age, so the average age at first cancer record, and we broke this down by transplant status. Um, so the uh, orange bars are the uh, average age at first cancer record for people who have not had a transplant. The blue bars are the average age of, at first record for those who have been transplanted. Um, and I think important to note specific, specifically for the transplant population, um, that average age has certainly increased from about 40, 10 years ago, and now we're looking at almost 50 years old at average age of first cancer record. Then we broke it down into cancer types in people with CF in the registry. Um, and I think this is a really important slide. So on the left-hand side, this is what we have in our patient registry. Since 2012, there are a little over a thousand recorded um, record of cancer types in the registry. Unfortunately, 83% of those are unknown. Um, but when we look at the ones that we do know and have been defined, there's 186. Not surprisingly, the one that is highest is colon cancer. Um, we also have breast cancer, lymphoma. The lymphoma patients are mostly those that are post-transplant. Um, and then a smattering of prostate, cervical, testicular, thyroid, and ovarian. Um, when we compare that to the U.S. population, what we were able to see is that there is a different pattern in people with CF, and so there's a higher... Um, rate of colon cancer, lymphoma, and um, even cervical cancer in the CF population. So when we look at different characteristics, what do these individuals look like? Again, we're basing this off of our 622 all cancers in 2023. Um, I think it's important to keep talking about the unknown type, 492, we just don't know. Um, about a third of them, so 200, um, are those with any type of transplant, solid organ transplant. And so um, that is not surprising. As most of you know, the immunosuppression afterwards does lead them to increased risk of malignancies post-transplant. But I think this is a really important um, part of the community that we need to focus on. 
And then I'll draw your attention. I don't know the answer to this. It may mean nothing, but I think it's important because it's very different than the other populations. Um, for the percent of those on enzyme replacement, breast cancer and prostate cancer were much lower at 44 and 56% compared to the other cancer types. Those individuals between 80 and 90% were on um, enzymes. And then we look at median age um, at recognizing cancer in the individuals. Um, we have a much higher age for both breast cancer and prostate cancer. And then when we look at cervical cancer, and we have to be a little careful here because there's only seven, um, but I think it's important and something we would want to keep an eye on moving forward. Um, their average age at recognition of cancer is 42, which is different than the general population. It's about 50. The median age of cancer, of cervical cancer diagnosis is 50. And then moving on to primary causes of death, just looking at my time. Um, so in 2023, we had 18% of deaths were cancer related. The 27 are those that actually had a cause of death um, of cancer and the 42 um, deals it means that 42 of those that died had a history of cancer, but not necessarily um, a cancer related death. And then of the deaths in people with a known cancer type, not surprisingly, colon cancer, we had 11 recorded. And then pancreatic cancer, we had six. So again, another type that I think we really need to um, look into further. There were some changes made to the CF patient registry in 2024 to expand our collection. Um, so in under, under other complications, the cancer confirmed by histology, we now have a spot where you can click the specific cancer type. Um, right now, it just has colon, pancreatic, breast, and other. And then if you click other, our ask would be that you then free type in what type of cancer it is. And this graph um, or chart is showing the reported cases so far in 2024. Um, there's almost 100 that have been reported so far. Um, the data doesn't lock until the end of February, so my hunch is that this will probably uh, increase. But again, you see breast cancer, colon cancer, thyroid, pancreatic, prostate as our top ones so far. So in conclusion, um, I think it's safe to say there has been an increase in the average age at initial cancer diagnosis, as Lynn said earlier, um, most likely due to an aging CF population, um, more so for those who have had a transplant. The precise cancer types have been identified in only 17% of the cases reported in the registry. So I really think it's important that improving data capture of cancer events in the registry, really it's gonna be crucial for our understanding moving forward regarding the burden and the characteristics of cancers in people with CF. And then the pattern of cancer types, like I mentioned, in individuals with CF does differ, um, at least from this data, from that of the general population with colon lymphoma and cervical cancers appearing more common in the CF population. And then lastly, again, the cervical cancer onset in women with CF may occur earlier. Again, word of caution, it's a very small number that we have right now, um, but still worth noting that the data that we do have, the average age is 42 compared to about 50 years in the general population. And that's it. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right. Next up, we have Alexis Lopez, um, who's a registered dietitian, clinical dietitian uh, at Keck Medicine of USC in Los Angeles, California. Alexis is approaching five years uh, as an adult CF and advanced lung disease dietitian for inpatient and outpatient services. She completed her bachelor's of science degree at California State Polytechnic University Pomona and her master's at Texas Tech University. She will speak to us today about her center's approach to improving their colorectal cancer screening approach. Thank you. Good morning. Today I'll be presenting on a collaborative model for colorectal cancer screening in adults. I have nothing to disclose. I first briefly wanted to go over the colorectal cancer screening recommendations given by the CF Foundation back in 2018. They had recommended patients and people with CF age 40 and older and people with CF uh, post organ transplant within two years be screened for a colonoscopy. If the results were negative, they were to be rescreened in five years, and if they were positive, have a resurveillance in three years. 
This being that people with CF are at five to 10 times greater risk of developing colorectal cancer, while post-organ transplants are up to 25 to 30 times greater risk. Our team back in 2022 had realized that we had a low completion rate for colonoscopies uh, since this came out in 2018. Major reason being that with COVID-19, we were not asking patients to come into the hospital unless it was completely necessary. There was also an increased appointment burden as some patients were having to uh, get a uh, appointment with the GI team prior to their procedure and also having some barriers with contacting GI to make an appointment. We also did not have a champion at the time to complete this effort. So myself and one of our CF physicians decided to champion this effort. The first thing we needed to do was screen and prioritize our patients. With screening, we have 165 patients, so we went through and did screening process with chart reviews, asking patients in their follow-up assessments, seeing if they've done a colonoscopy locally and maybe we just didn't have those results. And then if they had done a colonoscopy, seeing what the results were and seeing if they are due for a repeat colonoscopy. So uh, for the first thing is at the top of our priority was our post solid organ transplant patients. The furthest out was at the top going to the most recently done. And then for age oldest to youngest and then positive family history was another thing that we had wanted to prioritize as well. As patients are ready, already are at a higher risk for colorectal cancer and so having a positive family history was going to be even more so of an elevated risk. We were asking patients at their initial appointment, also at follow-ups, and now annually as this can change year to year. The next thing was figuring out a GI champion. So our CF physician had reached out to our GI colleagues and was able to find two providers that were more than willing to take our patients. We did have 551 patients identified in 2023 for getting a colorectal cancer, or cancer screening. Um, so we did have a good amount of patients that were due. And they were also comfortable with the possibility of having lower lung function in these patients. We luckily were able to just find a one male, one female provider. This just happened to happen that way, but some patients did have a preference on the gender that the physician was going to be to complete this colonoscopy. The CF physician and GI physician then talked about decreasing appointment burden by having the patients be screened in the CF clinic and cleared for the colonoscopy by our providers. And so they were able to forego that GI appointment. The next thing was moderate sedation versus monitor anesthesia care, or MAC. So our nurse practitioner went through our priority list and put down what the patient's last FEV1 was recently in clinic. And the physicians saw that with an FEV1 less than 45%, as they have a lower respiratory um, function, it increases their risk for respiratory depression with stronger sedatives. And so they had recommended moderate sedation. With an FEV1 greater than 45%, they had the uh, discretion of the GI physician to determine which one they would want to do. If the patient had done a colonoscopy previously and failed moderate sedation, then MAC was pursued. One barrier that came up was that the anesthesiology team that works closely with our GI team had recommended that patients with cystic fibrosis related diabetes have a hemoglobin A1C within the last three months prior to their procedure and the results be less than 9%. However, after our CF physician and GI physician talked, they were able to null this requirement as the CF team was going to clear these patients and any concerns would be addressed between the teams prior. The next thing was the colonoscopy bowel preparation, as this is more extensive than general population. The first prep that we trialed was the original Golightly two gallons, magnesium citrate and Ducalax. However, back in 2022, magnesium citrate was recalled. And so patients were having to not use that during their, pep, their prep, but some patients were having to repeat their colonoscopy as they were not adequately cleared. So we trialed magnesium or milk of magnesium instead. However, again, it wasn't adequate enough. So we went to prep number two, which was soup prep. They would do one kit the night before and one kit the day of. And it was six ounces of the soup prep liquid mixed with 10 ounces of water and drink at least 32 ounces of water within the next hour. Again, this would be twice. 
However, we did have some barriers with this prep as well. One being copay. It was about $150 give and take each patient depending on their insurance. Um, and so that was an increased amount of money that patients would have to pay. There is sometimes a lack of availability as well since some pharmacies did not have the soup prep on hand and so they would have to order it. So if we were on a time crunch, this was something that we wouldn't be able to go with. And also insurance authorization. This could take a little bit of time as well. So again, having to look at how long in advance we have to get this prep compared to when their appointment was scheduled. Lastly was prep number three, which was Miralax 17 grams twice a day and Ducalax daily for six days prior. And then mixing Miralax 255 grams in 64 ounces of water or Gatorade, I'm sorry, um, the night before and then the day of. So that ends us with the mixture of PrEP 2 and 3. So we always want to make sure that we are looking at the patient's current bowel regimen. As some patients are already on Miralax three times a day, Ducalax, Amatiza, Motegrity, depending on the patient. So we always want the patients to do exactly what they're doing currently and then add from there. We also had a look at availability. So if patients needed something very quickly, then usually we'd choose Miralax. However, if we did have time, then sometimes we would do soup prep. And for our more constipated patients, we would add either uh, magnesium citrate, now that it's back on, on the shelves, um, or do a mixture of certain ones. And also always looking at the financial burden that it would need for these patients to do this. The next thing was also dietary modifications. So always educating on the foods that should be avoided. So patients should be following a low residue diet three days prior to their colonoscopy, and then a clear liquid diet the day before. However, we did come through some challenges with some of these things as some patients didn't realize this full extent. So we did have to go back and add some things to the avoid list. As for example, one patient ate two bags of uh, dried fruit, not thinking that there was any fiber in it as she thought it tasted like candy. Um, but of course, that is something that you need to look at if they're not adequately cleared. One, asking if they've done the bowel regimen completely and adequately, but also asking for a diet recall as sometimes it is the dietary intake that might be the challenge of making sure that they are cleared prior. Also, some of our patients are on CFTR modulators, so we did talk to our GI colleagues and they were okay with patients taking the CFTR modulator in the morning. And as they are supposed to be taking it with fat, we recommend one teaspoon of whole fat yogurt or avocado or peanut butter to be taken with it the morning of. The next thing is GI scheduling. So our CF, um, clinic is in charge of the insurance authorizations. So for any pre-certifications and peer-to-peer -peer authorizations, it's done by our CF physicians, but we also have a designated prior authorization coordinator in our office that does the prior auths as well. These are the diagnosis codes that we use, and we always ask our providers to put in their documentation for CF follow-up visits um, this verbiage, so that way we are able to submit this for authorizations right away. We also have a GI scheduler that is designated for our patients. So patients are going to be called directly. They usually call at least three times and leave a voicemail. And if they are not able to get in contact with them, then they'll let us know as we are sometimes a lot easier to be able to get in touch with, with our patients and see if there's any barriers. And they also provided a direct phone number to the GI scheduler, so that way they didn't have to go through the uh, operator or having to go through the steps of having some difficulties with getting in contact with somebody. So it made it much easier. So that was our process for our hospital. However, some patients did want to go locally as sometimes transportation could be an issue. So we wanted to make sure that there was a workflow for this as well. Starting off with patients are in charge of figuring out which GI physician they want to see locally. Once they are able to find that out, they are to tell us and then we are able to provide that local GI with a letter from our physician, just talking about what um, their history is with CF, also asking them that we are the ones to prescribe the colonoscopy bowel preparation as it is more extensive than a general population. And then also letting them know that if they do have any questions that our CF physician is available if needed. We also put our fax number so that way they are able to send us those colonoscopy results right away. 
So these are our results. So for our colonoscopy in 2022, we had 12 patients complete a colonoscopy. And in 2023 at our facility, we had 24 patients complete a colonoscopy. So we were able to double that number. We did have an additional 10 patients that were scheduled for a colonoscopy. However, because of transportation issues, work conflicts, child care concerns, also fear of procedures, some patients did cancel their appointment for that year at least. And then we had an additional seven patients complete it locally. So of our 51 patients, we were able to have 31 complete a colonoscopy in 2023. At Keck, or at our hospital, we had out of 24 patients, nine of our patients had polypectomy results. So they were having um, a positive result for the colonoscopy. In summary, our quality improvement, we believe was a success, um, but we do think that one, having the priority list updated very frequently and being in contact with the GI physicians and also the GI scheduler frequently is very necessary. Also, a lot of communications between our physicians, CF and GI, also helped with getting some success from this, this uh, project. And also having the specific designated GI scheduler was very helpful. Lessons learned, it was making sure we did have a workflow for local referrals too. And also the hemoglobin A1C also had a little bit of a setback for us as we were pushing patients down the list um, because of needing to have more controlled blood sugars. But once we were able to null that requirement, that was able to get some of those patients, especially since they were post-transplant, most of them. And then also too, I would say in general, our team, it, it's a big team effort. Uh, our nurse practitioner, our uh, GI physicians, CF physicians, pharmacists, everyone's kind of on board with this project. And so um, I want to thank them as well for helping out with this project. Thank you. All right, up next is Dr. Krunal Patel, uh, who is a resident at UCSD with plans to pursue a pulmonary and critical care fellowship. Uh, he first became interested in CF as a medical student, rotating through the advanced lung disease and transplant department at Innova Fairfax Hospital. He was struck by the strong bonds patients with CF formed with their healthcare team due to their complex needs and frequent visits, as well as the interdisciplinary approach to care. He's also worked on various research projects to learn more about CF, including the one he will speak about today in regards to EGD findings. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so our research is focused on EGD findings in um, adults with cystic fibrosis and what that, uh, the implications for that for screening and management. Um, I'm at UCSD, as Lynn, uh, Katie mentioned, uh, but all of this research was done at Inova Fairfax Hospital with the team sitting right there. So thank you so much for your support. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, so this all started, as has been noted, um, in 2018, there were recommendations made for people with CF to undergo a screening colonoscopy at 40 years of age. Um, and then if you have transplant at 30 years of age um, or other specific re recommendations um, due to increased GI malignancies. Um, it's also been noted that people with cystic fibrosis have increased, increased prevalence of Barrett's esophagus, GERD, um, and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Um, I think the rates of Barrett's rate from anywhere, Barrett's and carcinoma rate from one to 5%, uh, which is about three to 5% more than people without cystic fibrosis. Um, and then rates of GERD rate from like 35 to 80%, which is significantly higher than people without cystic fibrosis. Um, so our question really was, um, since all of these uh, patients are undergoing uh, screening colonoscopies, would it be beneficial for them to undergo EGDs as well, given the high rates of GERD and Barrett's and cancer? And so we did a retrospective chart review at I know Fairfax Hospital um, of all patients who were 40 years or, or older. Um, we looked at all the patients who had their colonoscopies um, and then had EGDs alongside their colonoscopies. Obviously, their results had to be available for us to review to make any sense of them. And then we did review pathology reports if they were uh, um, available as well. Um, and so this 18 patients in total ful uh, fulfilled all these criteria. Um, we also did do chart reviews of all these patients to see um, if they were on PPI therapy prior to their EGDs. And so big picture results is that of the 18 patients who underwent EGDs, um, about 90% or 16 patients had abnormal results. Um, and this in 
And clinical judgment was sort of, these were clinically significant results. Um, so for example, patients with hiatal hernias were not included in the abnormal categories. Um, and only two, two patients or 10% had normal results. Um, quick note before we move on is the indications for EGD. Um, so for all of these 18 patients, um, eight patients were asymptomatic. So it was made sort of, uh, clinical judgment was made for these patients to undergo EGD based on the high rates of GERD um, and cancer. Um, six patients were symptomatic, so they did have an indication to undergo EGD, not just screening. And then four patients were uh, post-transplant patients. And so the results, um, kind of going from left to right, we'll go down our upper GI tract. Um, six patients, or about a third, had esophagitis. Two patients, or about 10%, had Barrett's esophagus. Six patients, about a third, had gastritis. Five patients, a little less than a third, had polyps. And then four patients, about a quarter, had uh, duodenitis. And 12 patients, so two-thirds of the patients who underwent EGDs were already on PPI therapy um, before they underwent the EGD. And um, both the patients who had uh, Barrett's esophagus um, were also on PPI therapy. Um, so before we kind of dive into the implications, just going through some of the mechanisms regarding GERD and Barrett's and cancer in CF patients. Um, some of them are also prevalent in people with osteocystic fibrosis, notably transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. Um, I think some of them are more applicable to patients with CF, such as delayed gastric emptying. Um, there have been studies showing that uh, CF patients have increased um, acidity of their gastric contents compared to people without cystic fibrosis. And then there's chronic cough, which can lead to increased pressure between the stomach and the esophagus, which can also, also lead to reflux. Um, I think this is something that's kind of going to have a big impact is modulator therapy. Um, as discussed, um, the age at which people are having their first cancer has been increasing. Um, so I think this goes back to one colorectal cancer screening, um, which we're doing at 40 years of age, and whether that prevalence will change or whether the patients will be older when they have their first colorectal cancer now that they're on modulator therapy. Um, there have also been, in regards to GERD, there have been studies, there was a 2022 study that showed um, patients who were started on modulator therapy had decreased rates of GERD. Um, and so the question really will be, I, I don't think about sort of if we need to do screening, but when we need to do screening and wh whether those numbers will change. Um, and we know that the CFTR gene is also a tumor suppressor. And so now with modulator therapy and that channel functioning again, um, again, we might have a sort of de decreased risk of GI malignancy and um, that will be offset by the risk of aging, which is a major risk factor for cancers in all patients. So where to go from here? I think based on our study, I would say that patients should definitely undergo EGD screening at the time of colonoscopy. Again, the, the big caveat being modulator therapy, which our study did not, we did not assess the impact of modulator therapy um, on patients and their EGD findings. Um, the other big thing sort of also being that, um, pa so patients who are um, undergoing, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, the risk of EGD. So um, the risk of EGD um, with anesthesia sedation, I think is offset because they're already undergoing a screening colonoscopy. So I don't think um, we need to worry about the big cardiopulmonary sort of risk factors, but certainly um, an EGD has its own risk factors apart from colonoscopy, including um, bleeding infection, perforation. And then I think as goes with all screening concepts, uh, we will need to assess the cost effectiveness. So while we pour all these resources into doing EGDs for these patients, um, and, and our study found high abnormalities, but um, are those um, worth the sort of the cost and um, are we doing high value care? Um, and so I think key points would be that um, people with cystic fibrosis are, as we know, increased risk, risk for GERD and Barrett's esophagus and carcinoma. I think this is especially true for patients who are not on modulator therapy and then certainly patients who are post-transplant. Um, patients who are on modulator therapy, I think we will need to do further studies regarding the prevalence incidence of um, upper GI pathology and whether they would benefit from a screening EGD. Um, and certainly we need more data regarding um, the cost effectiveness of EGDs in these patients.
All right. Up next is Dr. Regia Arya, who is a fifth year respirology resident at the University of Toronto, where she will complete her training in June of 2025. Originally from Windsor, Ontario, she completed her MD at Western University before moving to Toronto for internal medicine residency and respirology fellowship. She just completed a hiking trip in Maine and is more and more convinced to move to the East Coast. We welcome you. Um, today, she will speak with us about emerging data regarding non-pulmonary complications in the CF population, specifically rates of malignancy. Amazing. Thank you both. So as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about emerging non-pulmonary complications in adults with cystic fibrosis compared to those from the general population. So I don't have any relevant disclosures to, uh, that are related to this presentation. As we know, people with cystic fibrosis are living longer. However, we have limited information about the prevalence of age-related comorbidities. Our study was specifically interested in cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and presence of cancers. However, in the context of this workshop, ABCs of cancer screening, we're gonna focus in specifically on our cancer outcome. So as we know, people with cystic fibrosis have an increased risk of certain malignancies. Most commonly, we're aware of GI malignancies, specifically colorectal cancer, which has led to advanced screening guidelines. However, as we've heard today, there are multiple other cancers that have been associated with cystic fibrosis, including esophageal cancers, breast cancers, testicular cancers, cervical cancers, hematologic malignancies. However, the association of these cancers with cystic fibrosis is less well understood. As we know, we have an aging CF population. This is a graph from the Cystic Fibrosis Canada 2022 annual data report. And we can see on the Y axis, the estimated median age of survival, and on the X axis, the year between 1984 and 2022. The median age of survival is increasing, and currently in Canada, the estimated median age of survival is 60 years of age. So in the context of our aging population, we think it's especially important to understand the prevalence of cancers and the age at which they occur. The objectives of the study were to assess the rate of non-pulmonary emerging comorbidities, including malignancies, in people with cystic fibrosis, both those without lung transplant and those post-lung transplant, and compare those rates to that of the general population. Um, in order to do this, we did a population-based cohort study. We included adults aged 19 years and older with and without cystic fibrosis in Ontario between April 1st, 2002 and March 31st, 2022. Um, as much as I want to come to the East Coast, for those who haven't visited Ontario, uh, it is Canada's most populous province. We have a population of around 16 million, and we house around 30% of Canada's cystic fibrosis population. In order to do this research, we had two main databases, the first being the Cystic Fibrosis Canada Data Registry. Many of you are already aware of this, but it includes demographic and longitudinal clinical data on individuals with cystic fibrosis, followed an accredited CF center, it's estimated that less than 1% of individuals with cystic fibrosis decline to participate in the registry. And we combine this with the health administrative databases held at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Specifically, we looked at the Ontario Cancer Registry, which indicates presence of cancers, and the Canadian Organ Replacement Register, which indicates the presence of transplants. By combining these two resources, we were able to have access to a really powerful tool that identified individuals with cystic fibrosis, and we were able to follow that to the relevant clinical outcomes. Um, in this case, the outcome of interest that we were looking at was cancer. We included all cancers with the exception of non-melanoma skin cancer. For our statistics, we presented rates as a number of cases per person years for both the cystic fibrosis and non-cystic fibrosis cohorts both those with and without lung transplant. And we use a generalized linear model to estimate the complication rates for a thousand person years, adjusted for age and sex at cohort entry. So we're gonna get into the results. Starting off, we're gonna talk about the differences in rates of malignancies in people with cystic fibrosis without transplant and those who are post lung transplant. Um, you're gonna see these icons here at the talk. The orange refers to those with cystic fibrosis. The more simple lung icon refers to those who have never had a lung transplant, and the spirals refers to those who are post-lung transplant. In total, in our study, we included 1,435 individuals with cystic fibrosis without lung transplant, 
and 208 people with cystic fibrosis who were post-lung transplant. The median age at cohort entry was 19 and 29, respectively. Getting into the results, this graph shows the estimated rates with a 95% confidence intervals of malignancy per 1,000 person years in people with CF adjusted for sex and age at cohort entry. So on the left side, you can see those who are with cystic fibrosis without a lung transplant, and on the right, those who are post lung transplant. And we can see that rates of malignancy are much higher in those post lung transplant with an event rate of 35 per 1,000 person years compared to six in the non-transplant group. If we break that down a little bit further and we look at uh, this table, which shows a median age and years at the time of first malignancy uh, seen in our uh, data period, we see those without a transplant developed first malignancy at 47, whereas those post-transplant had a median age of 37. So overall, we're seeing that rates of malignancy were higher in the post-transplant CF population compared to the non-transplant CF population, and that the median age of cancer was 10 years earlier in the transplant cystic fibrosis cohort compared to the non-transplant CF cohort. Next, we're gonna look at differences in rates of malignancy in people with cystic fibrosis compared to the non-cystic fibrosis general population. So again, in orange, we have those with cystic fibrosis, and in green, we have those without cystic fibrosis from the general population. We had included 1,435 adults with cystic fibrosis without lung transplant, and a little over 16 million adults without cystic fibrosis without lung transplant. The median age at cohort entry was 19 years and 34 years, respectively. So looking into this graph, which shows the estimated rates, again, with a 95% confidence interval of malignancy per 1,000 person years, in individuals without transplant adjusted for age and sex at cohort entry, we see people with CF on the left side and those without CF from the general population on the right side. And we can see that rates of malignancy are almost twice as high in those with cystic fibrosis. So a rate of around almost six events per 1,000 person years compared to three events per 1,000 person years in the non-cystic fibrosis, non-transplant population. Again, if we break that down further and we look at median age and years at the time of outcome, we see those with cystic fibrosis had a median age of 47 compared to the older age of 67 of those without cystic fibrosis. So overall, we're seeing within the non-transplanted cohort, people with cystic fibrosis had higher rates of cancers compared to the non-cystic fibrosis general population when adjusted for age and sex, and events are occurring at a younger age. Now we're gonna look at the transplanted cohort. So in total, we had 208 adults with cystic, with cystic fibrosis post-lung transplant and 1,265 adults without cystic fibrosis who had had a lung transplant. The median age at cohort entry was 29 and 61 respectively. And again, we're gonna go back to our table, which shows the estimated rates with a 95% confidence interval of malignancy per 1,000 person years uh, in the individuals with transplant adjusted for age and sex at cohort entry. On the left, we have people with cystic fibrosis, and on the right, we have the non-cystic fibrosis group. And we can see here in the post-transplant population, there's not a significant difference between these two groups with an overlapping confidence interval. However, if we again look at the median age and years at time of first documented malignancy, we see that people with cystic fibrosis in the top row had a median age of 37 compared to those without cystic fibrosis who had a median age of 67. So overall, we're seeing within the transplanted cohort, people with cystic fibrosis had similar rates of cancers compared to the non-cystic fibrosis general population. However, events were occurring at a median age of 30 years earlier. This slide really serves to break down the top three types of cancers we saw in each group. So again, on the left in the orange, we have the cystic fibrosis population, and on the right in the green, we have the non-cystic fibrosis population. In total, 57 out of 1,435 individuals with cystic fibrosis without a lung transplant developed malignancy, so around 4%. And the top two cancers that we saw were at GI and at cancers of the reproductive slash urinary organs. These were also the same top two cancers that we saw within the non-cystic fibrosis general population. 
For those who are post-transplant, 28 out of 208 individuals with cystic fibrosis developed cancer, so that's around 13%. Um, I will mention here, because of the small numbers, I wouldn't make broader generalizations based on this data, but I do think it's still interesting to look at the top three cancers. And the top three cancers that we saw were hematopoietic, gastrointestinal, and respiratory, which was the same as the top three cancers in the non-cystic fibrosis post-transplant general population. So overall, we're seeing that people with cystic fibrosis have high rates of malignancy that occur at a younger age than the non-cystic fibrosis general population. As such, it's important to ensure age-appropriate cancer screening is occurring in this population. And I've kind of set us up to talk about phase two of our study here. It's not the focus of this talk, but I will just present some preliminary data because I think it's relevant to our workshop. And the purpose of phase two was to answer two specific questions, which are, how well are we doing in completing cancer screening in people with cystic fibrosis? And does having a family doctor influence the rates of cancer screening? So this study was done between 2012 and 2022, and we looked for individuals who were ever screened for breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer within the age appropriate time frame. So for breast cancer, those who were 50 and above, cervical cancer, 21 and above, and colorectal cancer, 40 and above for the pre-transplant population, and 30 and above for those who are post-transplant. In terms of our first question, how well are we doing in completing cancer screening? This table shows the percent of age-appropriate cancer screening completed in people with cystic fibrosis. And we can see that the percent screen ranged from 46% for colorectal cancer pre-transplant to 67% for breast cancer. So we can see we have some room for improvement here. The next question was, does having a family doctor influence rates of cancer screening? This table shows the rate ratio with a 95% confidence interval of screening by cancer type among people with cystic fibrosis by primary care provider involvement. So we can see screening for breast cancer improved by 3.6 times if patients with cystic fibrosis had a primary care provider compared to those without. For cervical cancer, screening increased by 1.7 times. And for colonoscopy pre-transplant, rates of screening increased by almost 1.6 times. We didn't see a difference between rates of screening for colonoscopy post-transplant. So overall, we're seeing that availability of a primary care provider does increase rates of age-appropriate cancer screening. And to improve care for people with CF going forward, I think it's important that we consider further engagement with our primary care providers, especially knowing that people with cystic fibrosis develop malignancies at higher rates and at younger age than those from the general population. Um, I'd just like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Stevenson, who's been a wonderful mentor and really spearheaded this project, as well as all of our co-collaborators at St. Michael's, Dalhousie University, ICS and CF Canada, as well as CF Canada and CIHR for helping fund the project. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions at the end of the workshop. Thanks so much. All right, rounding it out is uh, Dr. Christina Thornton, uh, who is an assistant professor from the University of Calgary, who recently completed an adult respirology fellowship and postdoctoral training with a background in cystic fibrosis microbiology. Her research interests in particular relate to the microbiome and the role of anaerobic organisms during periods of clinical stability and pulmonary exacerbations. She will speak to us today about data regarding HPV and cervical dysplasia in adult females with CF. All right, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting us to give this talk. Um, and I think it's a really important topic. We've heard a lot already from the earlier speakers, that I think, set the preload with regards to the importance of cancer screening um, and cervical cancer has come up. This was actually a fellows project of mine. It's not often we think below the diaphragm as respirologists, but it's something um, I think of interest and in, um, hopefully can raise some awareness as we go on. Um, I have no relationships related to this presentation, but do have some funding um, that are noted there. So I just wanted to start off with a case um, that was one of our patients in our clinic, just to give a bit of context as to the importance of this recognition. Um, so this patient was a 39-year-old female. Her CF profile is noted below, and she did undergo a double lung transplant back in 2009. 
She had a previous pap smear in 2008 that was normal and notably did not have a history of vaccinations or pregnancies and really non-contributory from a gynecological history. Her immune suppressant medications um, for relevance are noted as per standard uh, treatment with regards to lung transplantation. And so back in 2014, 2015, she was actually found to have uh, two times abnormal pap smears noted to be HSIL and then developed um, further complications after cervical biopsy that did find features of HPV and again, diagnosis of HSIL. So just as a reminder for those of us that don't often think about this area and what these acronyms all mean, um, HSIL is a high grade squamous intracellular lesion um, and it is associated with severe dysplasia. So it's essentially a uh, prelude to a malignancy. Um, unfortunately, as time went on during her course, she had multiple abnormal PAPs, confirmatory cervical biopsies. She underwent five invasive procedures before recommendation towards hysterectomy. And it was noted in her last leap in April 2019, she did have P16 positivity, which is highly associative um, cervical cancer from HPV. Um, in January of 2020, she underwent a laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy and multiple other surgeries that were quite invasive, including laser treatment. And she had multimodal therapy aimed for curative intent in the form of um, carboplatinum and external beam radiation treatment. Unfortunately, in May of 2020, she had recurrent squamous cell cancer of the cervix despite therapy that was infiltrative um, and was resistant to high dose um, therapy. And so as the course went on, she had multiple imaging, including a PET scan that showed metastatic disease and biopsy from the liver did confirm squamous cell dissemination. So unfortunately, in December of that year, um, she had progressed quite substantially and she ultimately passed away at home from uh, stage four cervical cancer. And I think that really sets the stage for the talk that we're gonna be discussing today. So with regards to HPV, um, we do have a high lifetime probability of acquiring it. And in fact, about 80% of those sexually active develop at least one stigmata or HPV infection by age 45. And even though we often associate with cervical cancer, I think it's important to recognize and remember there are many sequelae of HPV associated diseases, including genital anal warts, other forms of cancer um, and cutaneous disease. Moreover, we know that cervical cancer outside of the CF population, much that of the general population, is the fourth leading cause of female cancer deaths worldwide. And over 90% of deaths are indeed attributed to HPV infection, which is incredibly important. And so when we, you know, when we look, think about this, we want to evaluate in the literature, what do we know about HPV and CF, um, as was highlighted earlier. And this French group here has really done a lot of work looking at the rates of this. And they did a retrospective analysis of sexually active CF women attending their CF center in France. And what they found is a small cohort, but looking at a group of those transplanted and non-transplanted and found over 40% of women did have an abnormality with abnormal PAPs in about a third of those transplanted. And I think this hits on the themes we've heard earlier from our speakers around considerations for risks in the post-transplant um, era. Moreover, over 20% did have HPV related disease. And so where our first study came from that I'm going to address is we did find in our um, CF clinic, we did have associations with cervical cancer. Um, it seemed to be disproportionate in terms of morbidity and mortality, particularly in the post-transplant females. And our group sought to actually look at this and determine prevalence of HPV-related disease in our single center. Um, this was published uh, just um, two years ago now. So just jumping into results, uh, we did identify through retrospective single center analysis, 34 trans transplanted females. You can see the demographics in a tiny table, which everyone always presents. But the key take home message here in those that had HPV complications versus those that didn't, that were all transplanted, there were no significant differences in clinical characteristics. Again, these were all lung transplanted individuals. Um, we found that across our cohort, 12 patients or 36% um, had one abnormal pap smear, the majority of which followed lung transplantation as opposed to preceding. And among those with abnormal pap smears, again, they tended to be quite young, which fits some of the registry data we just heard with a median age of 26 years. Nine had cervical dysplasia and three had refractory anogenital warts. It should be noted that in our single center, we may underestimate some of the ex other um, manifestations of HPV because this did require subspecialty involvement, um, obviously outside of a respirologist or CF center. 
And so if we were to look at the period prevalence during the study and the rates of complications, we found 35% as noted had abnormal pap smears, but I think it's important to note that 26% had cervical dysplasia and actually 11% has cervical cancer fulminantly of a median time from lung transplantation to first abnormal pap of about six years. Um, we did also, while not statistically significant given our small sample size, we did find trends towards greater odds of those of cervical dysplasia in those of CF and transplant compared to those without, although this has been nicely highlighted with larger registry data that was just shown. Um, across our cohort, two women required surgical vulvectomy, and in total, as noted, four women with regards to abnormal pap, so four of the 12 developed cervical cancer and two actually passed away from disease. And I think that's incredibly um, important because these are patients that underwent a life-saving lung transplantation only to unfortunately succumb from cervical cancer, which may be somewhat preventable as we'll talk about um, with regards to HPV management. And so when we think about HPV risk factors in CF, we know that profound immune suppression complication in solid organ transplants is a huge risk factor. And in fact, these are some of the rates published um, out of renal transplant literature primarily, where we find two to six fold higher rates of um, cervical neoplasias, three fold higher rates of cervical cancer, and while small numbers, quite high rates of volvular cancer. It should also be noted that, again, these are renal um, solid organ transplants, which are not as immune suppressed, of course, as those from lung transplantation, which we're more likely to encounter in our populations. And notably, aside from cervical cancer screening, which we've heard the rates could be better um, with regards to RCF population, there are no other routine screening programs for other HPV-related malignancies. So it's important as care providers to keep this at the forefront when we see our individual patients. We also know that vaccination against HPV is highly, highly effective. Um, there's been now multiple large international RCT studies published in highly prolific journals, such as the New England Journal and the Lancet, that show vaccination is safe and highly effective in terms of decreasing HPV infections by about 80%. Um, these vaccines typically do multiple serotype targeting um, against multiple serotypes that are associated with malignancies, with 16 and 18 being the most common. And it is known that the greatest impact and recommendations are towards adolescents prior to sexual debut, which is highlighted in all clinical guidelines around HPV vaccination. And so one thing to pose, um, and this has also been a follow-up study from the group in France, is I can just ask people in this audience, are you aware of your HPV um, patient vaccination status? And this group actually sought to look at that through analysis from healthcare provider out input. And they found healthcare provider positive advice and fear of HPV related disease were the main rationale justifying vaccination decisions by patients. And indeed, some of the main barriers were insufficient knowledge and concerns. And I think this is important because often our patients are looking to us in CF clinic to provide these recommendations, just given the close therapeutic relationship. And it's something that um, more and more as time goes on, I think we'll have to be aware of this. Um, it should also be noted in our transplant population, none of the patients were vaccinated against HPV, either prior or following transplant. And notably, there are no consensus guidelines regarding HPV vaccination specifically prior to lung transplantation. We know that in Canada, and these are guidelines very similar in the US, HPV vaccination is recommended for adolescents over age nine, as mentioned, with the greatest efficacy before sexual debut. There are some fine print um, recommendations around catch-up periods, but it's recommended on a case-by-case -case basis, which one could argue with transplanted patients in particular one should consider. And so lastly, I just wanted to present some data on a study we just recently finished as a follow-up to our original study, um, where we were curious to look at HPV prevalence, impact, and vaccination barriers actually across Canada in CF individuals. So this was a cross-sectional national online survey of patients. It was disseminated through adult CF clinic centers um, in Canada. We got a feedback of 235 individuals to determine um, self-reported HPV infection, prevalence, complications, quality of life, and vaccination status and barriers. And so, as mentioned, we had about 235 individuals across Canada, 84% were from urban areas, um, nearly three quarters had an educational level above high school. Not surprisingly, the median age was about 34, probably given comfort that we did advertise quite a bit on social media, so maybe that was part of it. Uh, majority were female sex um, and identified as a woman in terms of gender, and 13% had a prior lung transplant. Um, with regards to the data around um, self-reported HPV knowledge, 95% did in fact 
you know, suggest that they have heard of HPV, they were aware of it. And about half of females had a prior pap testing that was abnormal. 21% um, had a history of HPV related exams to evaluate complications. 12% had a history of HPV complications outside of prior PAPs. And of those, about 70% require colposcopy for further assessment. I think one thing that was really striking when we reviewed this data is only about 19% had ever reported discussions with their CF care team around HPV and HPV complications. And again, I think given that the standard in most CF centers is to act as primary care for those patients, this is probably a gap that we're not meeting in terms of clinical need. Um, not surprisingly, but concerning is that 62% were unvaccinated for HPV and amongst those vaccinated, only about 41% had completed all three doses. This data very much was in line with the French data where we found 80% had reported never having a discussion with their care provider. And interestingly, amongst those of lung transplant, the figures were reversed, where a large chunk, about three quarters, had discussed with their CF care team. So again, we're probably missing a gap with regards to um, discussions with our patients outside of the transplant sending. Moreover, when asked for self-reported um, reasons as to why they weren't vaccinated, the number one reason was lack of discussions with their CF care provider, which again really mirrors that of the initial French survey that was done earlier. Um, lastly, we were interested to look at self-reported quality of life, and this is measured by um, an HPV impact profile with higher scores showing um, higher burden in terms of quality of life. Not surprisingly, amongst those of self-reported complication, high psychosocial burden was noted, and the highest burden was self-image, sexual impact, and worries and concerns, which you can see highlighted there. So just to summarize in terms of take-home points, I think um, for me anyway, this study was very important to learn. Again, as a respirologist, it's not something we are taught of or thought of normally, but it's important to recognize that we really should be recommending vaccination to individuals of CF before sexual debut, just to mirror that of the general public guidelines. Um, although hearing some of the registry data, there may be some factors specific to CF that may um, increase um, malignancy risk, such as chronic mucus inflammation and that inflammatory milieu. There is a greater risk of HPV morbidity and mortality as potential transplant recipients, although with the advent of ETI, this is probably decreasing. Best efficacy is noted at primary protection. Um, vaccination of adults outside of that classic um, timeframe for vaccination should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, regardless of sexual debut, as this can reduce risk. We should make sure in particular of the transplant individuals to screen for all HPV complications. And I think lastly, the take home point is that this is a CF problem that does require attention by CF providers. And as we have an aging population, it's probably gonna become more and more relevant. So with that, um, I just wanted to acknowledge, obviously, the patients from our clinic, um, Dr. Parkins, who was a mentor to me during my fellowship for this project, Dr. Sumayaji and Dr. Chu, who helped a lot with the study design and everyone else at the clinic. Thank you. All right, so we're going to start the question and answer portion. If our speakers could come up and sit here so we can ask you questions. Is that on? Uh-oh. Excuse me. Uh, is the mic on? You on now? Hello. There okay. My question is for Dr. Lopez. Uh, very important work you're doing because uh, I'm a GI. So a couple of questions I had was, uh, did you have any conversations with the anesthesiologist? Because um, I didn't see that. Uh, in terms of your providers, and uh, how did that go? And then in terms of the location for your screening colonoscopies, is it safe for these patients to have it done at the ASC? Does it depend on their FEV1? What is your recommendation? For, the, for that portion, um, for that portion, no, um, our physicians were the ones that, I'm the dietitian, okay. um, so our physicians are the ones that are talking to our anesthesiology team. I know they did have a meeting with them regarding that, um, but they are trying to go more towards moderate sedation, which was their recommendation as much as possible. Okay, and then for the recommendation of taking Trikafta with the yogurt, some of them require like at least six hours you know, before, so that would be something to, to mention to them as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So, hi. My question is for Dr. Arya. 
Um, thank you for that presentation. It's very clear. Um, so when you show us the data of transplanted CF versus non-CF and the huge median gap, age gap of um, cancer incidence, could that just be explained by the um, age gap that we know about lung transplant recipient when they actually received the lung transplantation because it's a huge age gap? Have you adjusted for that? Or? Yeah, I, that's a, a really good question. So all of our data was post adjustment for age at cohort entry. And we also split up the data um, again to make sure that age was accounted for. So we looked at age groups between 19 to 40, 40 to 60 and 60 plus. Among those 60 plus, we didn't really have a lot of outcome data for people with cystic fibrosis, but we saw the same increases in both the 19 to 40 and the 40 to 60 age groups. Well, thank you so much to everyone for attending. Um, I think I speak for both Lynn and myself when I say our speakers were excellent and they deserve another round of applause. And that concludes our session. Um, I will say, go to the next slide. Um, our speakers also have their contact email here. If any of you didn't want to stand up and speak to them, but did want to send them an individual email, you may write down um, and send them an email and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>